now. An interview we've been waiting for for a while. Dr. Ron Paul! Congressman from the great state of Texas. Dr. Paul, thank you for joining us. Good to be with you. Uh, we have a lot to discuss. Let's get to the economy first. Uh, Tim Geithner is asking for more regulatory uh, power at the Treasury Department uh, today. Uh, what do you make of that? Uh, do, are you in favor of that proposal or against it? No, I'll be opposed to it because it implies the fact that all our problems have come by not having enough government bureaucrats running around and regulating the economy, and that's not the case. Uh, we have plenty, and the more we get, the uh, worse the economy gets. I mean, early in this decade, we had problems with Enron, and they created the Sarbanes-Oxley bill and it introduced many, many more regulators, and actually the conditions got much worse. So, no, uh, we should have regulations on the market, but they should be different. They should be regulating the Federal Reserve, and they should uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, there's no fraud and, and no theft and these kind of things. So there's a lot that can be done. Uh, but but not the type of regulation which is uh, a prior restraint type of regulation. I oppose to that. I'm opposed to that. Uh, that's a fascinating perspective on it. I want to save the Fed for a little bit later because I know you have strong opinions on that. But let, let's talk about regulation for a second. You, you, you think that there should be less regulation, but when we deregulated, when we took away the Glass-Steagall uh, Act and that allowed the commercial banks to join up with uh, security interests and the insurance companies, uh, that led to banks that were too big to fail. And then on top of that, when we deregulated uh, the CDSs, that allowed wide-scale gambling that got us into this mess in the first place. Wouldn't it be better off if we had regulators watching out for how much risk these companies were taking? Yeah, yeah as soon as there's fraud committed, then you deal with it. But uh, none of that can happen without a Federal Reserve creating easy credit and all this leveraging and the pyramiding of debt. That's where the bubble comes from. The bubble doesn't come from the lack of regulation. It comes from the Federal Reserve that artificially lowers, or lowers interest rates and causes this speculative binge, and then they do all those kind of things. When they commit fraud, all the, you know, the Enron scam that was taken care of with all the fraud laws in Texas and it was handled, so we didn't need more laws. But a lot of that stuff wouldn't happen. These derivatives is a, the ultimate climax of a speculative binge that comes from money that comes out of thin air. And uh, so that created the problems. Debt created the problem, and borrowing contributed to it. So we're trying to solve all our problems by spending more, borrowing more, and printing a lot more money. Uh, but no, and then people will say, and, and I think in, in your question it implies, well, we had too much freedom. Uh, of the market and do much capitalism, but that that isn't true. We we don't have we haven't had anything near what I think capitalism is like. I mean, we have this artificial monetary system, we have crony capitalism, we have the military industrial complex, we have this huge deficit financing, and and uh, we 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 don't have anything near what capitalism all, is all about. And now all we're talking about is partnerships. So we're moving toward fascism now rather rapidly. Representative Paul, you know, I want to get to the Fed, like I said before, but one more question here. When you say the regulation is not the answer, the SEC in 2004 uh, removed a rule that allowed for a 12 to 1 uh, ratio between equity and debt and allowed basically any kind of ratio you would like, which led to people taking out more loans and getting mm -hmm. riskier and riskier prospects. Right. Isn't that a situation where we could have used more regulation? Yeah. No, that's uh, but that but what you demonstrate is fraud. You know, in a free market it's banking system, it's not fraud system. though. I mean, that's the that's well, what that leveraging it. is. If it was legalized. It was legalized that they could have that type of leverage in a free market. You can only loan out if you have reserves, 100 percent reserves, and you don't only have. Only if there are reserves. rules. Only if there are rules. Not if you know, in a free market, if there are no rules, then you can loan out oh, anything yeah. you like without no, you any. Can't. No, no, the rule is you can't commit fraud. You can't say you have money in the bank if you don't. Now, we literally created a system which is called fractional reserve banking that the banks don't actually have any money. Every bank is insolvent. If everybody went to the bank tomorrow and asked for their money, they don't, they don't have it. So the whole system is based on the fact that the government will always bail them out, and that creates the moral hazard. So, uh, but I think your concern would be dealt with rather sharply with the free market because the free market would be much tougher. There would be uh, no no free. Uh, uh, it would be 100 percent reserve standards. Yeah. So, uh, Congress, it, it's, it's worthwhile. It, you'd have to read Murray Rothbard 
on that uh, uh, to to really understand it. But 100 percent reserves would solve that problem, and, 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 and they would but, be held held to task by uh, no no permission to to uh, commit fraud. And literally, by what you described, is we legalize fraud, and that's what our monetary system is. We legalize counterfeit. That's well, what we do. But I mean, yes, uh, Congressman Paul, just a, a question about what you're what you're talking about, and and then sort of another follow-up question: the, the ideology uh, that you're talking about. Um, is there an American precedent for that, or is it is it kind of pie in the sky? I mean, what? Well, is, that's sort of asking, like, is there a precedent for perfect socialism? And uh, of course, the extreme, uh, of course, was the Soviets, and that wasn't perfect. Uh, no, there's no perfect example of a free society, but we probably have had the best example and the best introduction. And we also had the maximum, maximum amount of productivity, and we had the maximum amount of wealth created when we were a much freer society. We had, we had pr- ex- the best period of time in our history when we've had economic growth was the latter part of the 19th century, and prices actually went down, and people were much richer. So, uh, but no, uh, uh, my 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 goal is idealistic, and I know I can't reach that. But it's the opposite of a socialist, fascist type of system. And we're, we're with uh, we're talking with uh, Texas Congressman uh, Ron Paul, uh, Dr. Paul. Just uh, you know, talk, just sort of a, a follow on that, but more a, b- a big picture here. You know, you're talking about your ideology. If you could have one uh, sort of, it, one one part of your thought process uh, enacted um, into law, what would be the first thing in terms of attacking the problems that are in our economy right now? What would be the, the your number one on your priority list? Understanding why personal liberty is so important. If a person understands personal liberty, they understand the right of that individual for everything he earns, he gets to keep, and that's his property. And to do that, you have to have a, a private property free market uh, system, but you have to understand that everybody owns their own personal life, which guarantees their social freedoms as well. The same freedom I'm talking about in the economy is the same freedom I want the press to have, there should be no prior restraint, and I don't want people legislating morality in their personal lives. So I apply those same rules to the economy as I do to personal freedom as, as, uh, as well as to the press where there's no prior restraint. I don't want prior restraint. And, and, you, and when people hurt each other or if, uh, if the press libels somebody, they're responsible. The, the press can make mistakes, there's no doubt, and they can do bad things and dumb things, and, and there's a lot of horrible things that come out when I protect freedom of, of, uh, of speech. Uh, but at the same time, I don't ever want prior restraint. So I don't want prior restraint in the economic matters, except for these basic rules of no fraud and no counterfeit and, 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 and no, no violence. Representative Paul, it seems that we're almost having a, a, a discussion about what are, we mean by free markets. Because, you know, and, and that's important. Because do I want free markets? Of course I do. Am I in favor of capitalism? Obviously. But I think that in order for capitalism to thrive, there has to be certain rules and regulations. As, if, as a sporting event, if you're going to play basketball, you need certain rules. Otherwise, everybody will commit a foul. Because it is in the nature of human beings to want to take things to their advantage, which is how the system works and capitalism works. So. Uh, you know, when when you say 100 percent reserve, uh, if I have that right, wouldn't that be a rule too? Yeah, but it would be no fraud. It would be a no fraud rule. I, if you put 100 dollars in my bank uh, and you want it there tomorrow, I'm not. In, if I don't want to commit fraud, I can't loan it out. But if you put 100 dollars in my bank, I can loan it out to the next person and keep 10 dollars in the bank uh, and reserves. There's 190 dollars in a split second. And that, to me, is fraud. So then, if, you so, put if you put $100 in my bank and promise you don't want it for three months, then I can loan it out uh, for three months. So, yes, there are st- very strict rules. The market is very, very strict. Uh, for instance, the market is very strict on, on pri- and protecting property and protecting the environment because you have no right to violate another person's property or another person's life. Uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, in many ways much stricter today when you depend on the government, then the corporations get in charge of the government, and then they get control and they get special privileges, and then you end up with 
uh, all these rules benefiting a certain. That's why there's a huge tax code because uh, everybody gets to lobby for what they want. Well, that's it certainly true. Uh, we're, so, we're talking to Congressman Ron Paul from uh, Texas. Uh, Congressman, what I wanted to follow up with there is, if you have a hundred percent reserve rule, wouldn't that slow the economy tremendously? Because investment is the you know the engine of the economy, and obviously that would slow down investment yeah. to nearly a stop. It would, it would slow, it would slow, no, it wouldn't do that, but it would be more solid growth. You would have no, uh, no bubbles. Uh, well, and, you would uh, have no bubbles, that's true. And, and right. if that, but if that, if that philosophy were adopted to the insurance industry, um, as a whole, uh, in, in terms of life insurance and health insurance, too, that would be, I, I would guess, somewhat disastrous because they, th this philosophy, uh, Why? Why? Is is operate because that's how the insurance you know the insurance uh, industry will take your premium and pay it out on someone else. It's not a savings account just for you. Yeah, but that's a con that's a contract. It's, see, the economic contract should be identical to the social contract. I, I I'm sure you wouldn't object to people socializing and voluntarily and and practicing all all their habits and religious practices and sexual practices. We don't say, well, you might do something wrong. You might gamble or you might smoke something you shouldn't be smoking, so we've got to take care of you. So you can't have these preempted rules. But, uh, but if you protect property and do what you promise to do and uh, never defraud people and don't steal from people, uh, I mean, there are strict rules. But it is true you don't have the huge bubbles. You don't have stock markets going up. But the penalty, everybody loves the inflation, you know, in this fraudulent system and always depending on the government to take care of them. Conservatives love it in, in the social sense because the government will take care of us. My kids will be raised up and they'll know not to ever look at dirty pictures and they can't have do Internet gambling. Liberals tend to think, oh, if well, the government's there regulating, there'll never be, you know, any problems in the economy and there will always be a safety net. And it's all well intended, but it turns out that they, they, it's self-destructive because you do have, uh, when, when the counterfeiter comes to town, you don't know it's counterfeit, everybody's very wealthy, but when it's discovered what's going on and it's a house of cards and it collapses, uh, so all the good times that you might see by the government participating collapses into what we have now, and I'm afraid we're going to be in a depression. But also those arguments are always the reason how they can finance wars, and these government regulations going in, the military-industrial complex gets control of the government, and then they build all these weapons. It just goes on and on, and you couldn't do that in a free society. I mean, not under our Constitution. It should never have been done anyway. Uh, Representative Paul, l let's move on to the Fed that you mentioned earlier. Uh, I know that you have some concerns with it, to say the least. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people might not even know what the Fed really is and how much power they have. Uh, they've done an end run around Congress now and loaned out trillions of dollars to these insolvent right. banks. Um, is there any way that Congress can gain control of what the Fed is doing, or are you oh, powerless? Yeah. Oh, no, we, we can. It, it, it was created by Congress in 1913. A lot of people, the conspiracy people, say that uh, it's a private bank and nobody knows anything about it and we can't do anything. It's secret because the, gov uh, the Congress allows it to be secret. It was created in 1913, and uh, since then, of course, it was the vehicle that's, that finances war, it financed for World War One, the bubble of the 20s, and you know, on and on. But it also causes the the, uh, the, the business cycle because they create money out of thin air. They literally can counter they can counterfeit money, but. Uh, there's no authority under the Constitution to have a central bank. Jefferson and Hamilton argued this case, and Jefferson was against it. Hamilton loved it. So we had a national bank that lasted for 20 years, and then another second national bank, and then Jackson got rid of that. Jefferson got rid of the first one. But then we didn't have a real super-duper central bank until uh, 1913, and, and we've had you know so many problems since. But it can cause booms, and people feel very good. But the penalty is so bad. I mean, this is how you end up. You can end up with runaway inflation, and that is so destructive. We, there's a lot of paper wealth that has been wiped off the books here with this uh, correction. But ultimately, if it wipes off the value of the dollar, and you said, what about what can the Congress do? Well, a, a modest step is a bill that I've just recently introduced, uh, H.R. 1207, and I'm getting a good bit of support by both sides. And it says that the Fed has to answer questions. Can you imagine they don't have to answer questions? They are exempt. Uh, they were, a law was written in the early 1950s 
It said the Federal Reserve was exempt from GAO auditing. And all the things that are important, all their negotiation, all their deals and everything they do, uh, they don't have to answer questions. And you mentioned even the trillions. Yes, I think, I think there could be five, six, seven trillion dollars of guarantee loans and extended loans taking care of all their buddies. I mean, it is. That is the big thing. I call it the fourth branch of government. Conservatives, liberals, populists, whoever they are, uh, libertarians, they should all be concerned about what's happening because it affects every single one of us. Uh, the value and of money is a big issue. Congressman, in, in terms of the, the politicians and, and, uh, and people in Washington that we know, that we're, with whom we're f- most familiar, who are the, the people that are protecting this sort of clandestine behavior on, on the behalf of the Fed? Who are the people that are, are going to be opposed to H.R. 1207? Probably the leadership of both parties. Yeah. And uh, and it's always the leadership in the White House. See, I've always argued that uh, regardless of which of the two parties you have in power, foreign policy stays the same and monetary policy stays, stays the same. And I think we're witnessing that. There, I mean, uh, McCain and, and Obama never talked about monetary policy in the Fed. And here you already know that they've created trillions of dollars, and the Congress doesn't even know about it. They they are they're bigger than the con- whole Congress. I think all this. Talk about salaries, uh, you know, there's bonuses, and even these hundreds of billions that we appropriate. I think it's uh, all just a distraction uh, for the really big things that are going on. Uh, nobody can even comprehend the trillions of dollars, but they can comprehend the 165 uh, million dollars worth uh, worth of bonuses. I don't know exactly, you, you know, why that happens, but I know foreign policy doesn't change. The wars are not going to end, even though. Uh, Obama had, uh, you know, much better statements on foreign policy, uh, but monetary policy will not change either. And, uh, you know, some people think we should live within our means and balance our budget, including a lot of Democrats. A lot of Democrat friends I have think so. Uh, and yet Republicans are elected to do something like that. And, and then look at what they did on the deficit. So uh, I think the only way we will come to our senses and reform this whole thing is that we have to realize that, for the most part, the leadership of both parties, uh, will, that, that we can't find the answer there. Uh, I think it has to be found outside that realm. All right, Representative Ron Paul, there are some things that we certainly agree on as far as the excess of the system. There are definitely things we disagree on as far as the solutions are concerned. Uh, but it is an interesting conversation, and we'd love to have you back on to talk about uh, marijuana as well, because that's also huge in the news. But we run out of time here, and we really want to thank you for your time. Well, thank you. I'm against that drug war. You know that. <laughs> I do <Thanks>. know that. <laughs> and we agree on that <laughs> as well. <laughs> if it's a drug war and those wars overseas. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we're, we're not doing well with the wars. <laughs> thank yeah, there you go. Thank okay, you so much for joining us. Thank we really appreciate you. it.